Hello, everyone. Welcome to this month's webinar, Altmetrics for Impact Predi Prediction and Benchmarking, the latest research. We're really excited to have um, Mike Thelwall and Mike Taylor here today to talk about some of the latest research that they've been working on with regard to impact prediction. <laughs> and right on cue, my dogs want to chime in. Apologies for that. Uh, so basically, before we get started, some brief housekeeping. Um, after a brief introduction of the speakers, we will hear from our speakers themselves, and then we will take questions after their presentations end. So if you have questions throughout the webinar at any point, please enter those into the box, the questions box, which you'll see on the lower right-hand side of the GoToWebinar control panel. I'll be managing our questions throughout the webinar, um, and I'll go ahead and share my screen now. There we go. So this webinar uh, is being recorded and we will be sending the recording out tomorrow. So let's go ahead and get started. Here are today's speakers in order of appearance. Uh, myself, Stacy Conkeel. I'm Altmetrics Director of Research and Education. I'll be today's host. Uh, first up, we'll hear from Dr. Mike Thelwall, who leads the Statistical Cybermetrics Research Group at the University of Wolverhampton in the United Kingdom. Mike has developed and evaluated free software and methods for systematically gathering and analyzing altmetric and webometric data, including data from uh, Mendeley, Twitter, Google Books, and the general web. He conducts evaluation exercises for large organizations using web data, including for the United Nations and the European Commission. Mike has co-authored hundreds of refereed journal articles about altmetrics and webometrics, and his most recent book is Web Indicators for Research Evaluation, A Practical Guide. Mike has done a great deal of research on altmetrics data, and we're very thankful to have him here today to share his wisdom. Then we will hear from Mike Taylor, Digital Science's Head of Metrics Development. Since getting involved in altmetrics in 2011, Mike has written several papers on the subject and conducted much research and is working towards a PhD with Dr. Thelwell, actually, at Wolverhampton University. Mike worked at Elsevier until 2016 in their metrics and analytics group and at Elsevier Labs before that. And previously, he collaborated with two groups of academics in the EU and US on some really interesting sponsored research projects in the area of social impact and semantic assertion modeling. So both of our speakers today are gonna to be talking about some of the latest research projects they've been working on that connect altmetrics, typically known as a type of data, that is good at measuring attention, uh, that connects altmetrics with impact. And this is a hotly contested topic, one that I'm sure is going to raise plenty of excellent questions during our Q&A. Before we get started though, a brief plug for Altmetrics Researcher Data Access Program. So since Altmetrics started as a company, we've given our data away for free to researchers like Mike Thelwall, who have used our data in order to help academia gain some new insights into what altmetrics mean and how they can be used. For researchers with non-commercial interests in using our data, we grant this free access in a number of formats. Our data has been used to learn new things like how variables like author gender and publication access affect the attention that research receives online, uh, how altmetrics correlate with citations, and even some of the things that we're going to learn about today. So if you have an interest in joining our program, please visit this link you see here to learn more. All that out of the way, let's move on to our presentations. So first up will be Mike Thelwall. Okay, hello everyone. Um, this is Mike Thelwall from the University of Wolverhampton. And um, you might be wondering where Wolverhampton is. So I thought I'd tell you that before starting the talk. It's in the middle of the UK. 
and um, Wolverhampton is famous for music, corner shop, uh, Goldie, Beverly Knight, and my uh, co-author on this presentation, Tamara Neville, who's also very good at music. So I'd like to talk about um, whether scientists could use altmetric.com scores to predict longer term citation counts. And uh, this idea came from people uh, telling me that they were interested in altmetrics, but they wanted to know if today's altmetric score would help them to know whether in the longer term their work would be more highly cited. So this is something that's been a uh, concern, at least in the UK, I think. So uh, I'd been investing investigating altmetrics for a while, but I hadn't in investigated this particular topic, so it, it uh, spawned a study. So as an example, here's an article published this year in January, and it has a high altmetric score. It's got a score of 27 on the altmetric attention score, which is in the top 5% of all research outputs scored by altmetrics. So it seems like a good article, but does that mean it's likely to be highly cited in the future? or does this score, is this score not relevant? So as background, in, uh, in many countries, council citations are, are widely used for informal and formal research evaluations. So researchers uh, and uh, research administrators are often interested in the citation counts and want to know if they can use them for, uh, to evaluate the quality of research or to help evaluate the quality of research. And it's true that in many fields, higher citation counts associate with higher quality research. So there's not a, a, a direct way that citation counts exactly measure the quality of research, but in general, in many fields, there is an association. If your work has more citations, then it tends to be higher quality, although it's not a hard and fast rule. But the problem with citation counts is that it may take two or three years to know whether your work is going to attract many citations. So they're slow to accumulate. And that's because after you've published your work, other people have to read it and then incorporate it into their research. And then their research has to be peer reviewed and published. And then finally, once it's published, then you can start seeing your citations. So altmetrics uh, are a po possible solution to this problem. So. Uh, by altmetrics, I'm including anything other than citation counts, essentially, that's uh, used to um, help evaluate the impact of research. But altmetrics are especially uh, taken from the social web and the web. Um, but they can, uh, the term could refer to anything other than citation counts. So for this talk, the most important aspect of altmetrics is their potential to give quicker impact evidence than, than citation counts. But they're also sometimes used to try to give evidence of wider impact. And that's because citation counts are derived from scholarly documents. And that means that they can only really reflect scholarly impact. Whereas if your work is ignored by scholars but solves important societal problems, then you might get very few citations. But the idea is that you might get altmetric attention instead, so you've got a different source of evidence for your impact. Um, but we have to be a little bit cautious with altmetrics because there, there is the potential to, um, for them to be uh, susceptible to spam and manipulations. But for many purposes, they're still useful. So for self-evaluations, absolutely no problem at all. And um, for um, for other types of evaluations where there isn't a big incentive for stakeholders to try and fix them. So I'd just like to say just a little bit about um, um, whether we use altmetrics to uh, measure research quality directly. So I, I like to avoid the term measure or metric for um, alternative uh, indicators, including altmetrics but because uh, some people get upset that they think that you're measuring their research with tweets or with blog posts. So I like to use the term alternative indicator to avoid the implication that we're 
measuring the quality of research. But other people use social media metrics to emphasize that um, it's not the quality of the research that they're measuring, but it's social media that they're measuring and um, using it to help indicate something about the value of research. So altmetrics can be useful if they associate with higher quality or greater impact research. So if we can get empirical evidence that higher altmetric scores mean that your research is more likely to have had an impact of any type, then that's good evidence that you can uh, take uh, altmetric scores seriously. So in terms of the study to predict future citations, uh, very few previous analyses have attempted this. And the main exception is, uh, in fact, a very early paper which showed that uh, the number of times an article had been tweeted associated with and could be used to predict how many citations it would have in the future for one specific journal, the Journal of Medical Internet Research. So for this journal, if your work is highly tweeted and when in the year when it's published, it's likely to be highly cited uh, later on. So for the study I'd like to talk about today, the research design was to take a large sample of articles published in 2015 and uh, use the altmetric scores that were available for them in 2015 using the uh, free data shared by altmetric. Uh, dot com for uh, researchers and then compare those scores with the scope of citations from 2017 to see if articles with higher altmetric scores in 2015 would also have higher scope of citations in 2017. So it's a type of prediction problem. So for this study, I took 30 narrow scopus fields um, from 2015 and uh, altmetric.com scores from November 2015 in uh, their data sharing sample from then. And these include separate scores for Mendeley, blogs, Twitter, news, Facebook, uh, Google+, Wikipedia, videos, site like Conatier and F1000. So for each of these sources, there's uh, a, a separate score for every article or zero if they don't have a, a count on any of these. And the scope of citation counts are from October 2017. And the, the method used to make the prediction is linear regression. So the linear regression was used on the scores for articles from 2015 from Altmetric to try to predict the uh, 2017 scope of citation counts. And the data was log normalized. The citation counts were log normalized to deal with uh, skewing. And for the primary study, articles without altmetric com records, altmetric.com records were, were thrown away. Uh, the, the findings are slightly weaker if you keep these articles. Um, but the reason why we threw them away was that it solves the problem that some of the articles in our data set hadn't been published when we had the first uh, collection uh, data sample, which was in uh, November of the year. So the, from the results, for 29 out of the 30 fields, the, the regression showed that the altmetric scores from 2015 significantly predicted the 2017 scope of citation counts. So altmetric scores do help you to, produ to predict future citation counts for an article for 29 out of the 30 fields. And the exception was a small field. So um, the except, it's quite likely that for most fields, this is true. And for the individual altmetric scores within the data set, the Mendeley read accounts were the most reliable. They were always a statistically significant predictor. And the other indicators such as Facebook, um, Google Plus tweets, sometimes useful predictors depending on the field and the only exceptions were that Conatier and F1000 scores were, were never useful in the regression equation they were never kept in the regression equation 
and the scores from 2015 explain about 20% of the variability in the citation scores from 2017. So you can't make a, a very accurate prediction from 2015, but um, you can do better than just guessing. So an alternative strategy that you might use to try and guess how many citations your article would get in the future um, is to look at the journal in which it was published. And if it's a journal that tends to get many citations to its articles, as reflected in something like the journal impact factor or some other measure of average citations per article, um, you might use that instead of the altmetric score. So we also looked at the different altmetrics in conjunction with or separate from the average uh, citation rate of the articles in a journal. So we use Scopus Sky Site Score, uh, which is uh, based on three years, but otherwise similar to the Web of Science Journal Impact Factor. And we use the site score that was available when the altmetric data was there in 2015. So it was contemporary with the altmetric data. And the results showed that the, uh, the altmetric data was good at predicting future citations. The site score was also good at predicting future citations, but the best option was to combine both. So for the most important, the most accurate prediction, you should take into account the average citation rate of articles in the journal in which you publish, as well as the um, altmetric score for your article. So the combination of the two does a reasonably good job at um, estimating how many citations you're likely to get in the future for an article. So prediction works, but there isn't a simple formula. The best formula varied between the different fields that we tested. Um, an issue I haven't mentioned is that the prediction is, is complicated by articles being published at different times throughout the year. So an article earlier in the year is likely to have higher scores by the end of the year and higher citations whenever you measure them than an article published later in the year. So that makes it more tricky to predict citation counts. And probably the most important lesson is that uh, although the prediction works, the common sense will help you to make a better prediction than a computer, I think. If you look at the article and look at the tweets or the other source, the sources that are mentioning it, you can probably get a better sense of whether the attention being paid to the article is likely to lead to future citations than uh, an automatic algorithm will do. So if you apply common sense together with the data, you can probably make a much better prediction than uh, I can. And also, finally, the scores shouldn't be taken as, as too serious evidence because there's still a lot of unexplained variance, a, a lot of variation between uh, variation in citation scores that doesn't relate to the altmetric scores. Okay, so overall prediction works, but there isn't a simple formula to make the prediction and human prediction taking into account the data seems to be the best option. Okay, thank you very much for listening. Thank you very much, Mike. That was fascinating. All right, so we will switch over now to hear from Mike Taylor, who is Digital Science's Head of Metrics Development. Mike, I'm handing the presentation mode off to you. Okay, I'm now unmuted. Thank you very much for joining us today. Um, I'm just going to pick the right screen. Okay, so I'm hoping that you can now see my screen. Um, do shout out, Stacey, if you can't, or if there is any other unexplained lag. So thank you very much for joining us, everyone. My name's Mike Taylor. I'm Head of Metrics Development at Digital Science. 
I work mostly on the dimensionless platform and the optometric platform. And today I'm going to be talking to you not only as an employee of digital science, but also as one of Mike Seawall's students. So I've been working in, in metrics and other issues around scholarly communication for, um, for over a decade now, metrics uh, a little bit more recently. Um, I wrote a report with uh, Christy Holmes and other people for NISO on different forms of scholarly communication a couple of years ago. And uh, I was one of the original architects of the ORCID platform. Now, head of metrics development is, is not one of your classic job titles. Um, the type of work that I do is not immediately obvious to everyone. Um, my kids say um, when they when they ask what I do is uh, I sit in front of a computer looking cross most of the time. And that's pretty much uh, pretty much close to it, I guess. Um, I do spend a lot of my time staring at data, understanding it, but the majority of my time is spent working within the community. So I'm not someone who is a, a classic data scientist by any means. I spend a lot of my time reading uh, papers, reading blogs, understanding how people in the research evaluation and science metric communities are beginning to use data to understand trends in uh, scientific uh, publications and findings and outputs. And I spend quite a lot of my time going to conferences and doing presentations. Uh, this particular event that's pictured in the bottom right hand was an ACM LSF IEEE meeting last year on reproducibility. And I was doing some uh, work there on understanding how, um, how we might be able to create indicators around uh, reproducibility and openness that can be used to uh, to make reports to funders downstream. So head of metrics development, not a classic job title, and involves a lot more than just crunching numbers. Um, so my previous existence when I was working on a, on a large scale journal metrics um, uh, very, uh, project, um, we spent something like a month working on the mathematics of the metrics and coming up with different variations. Um, and then, believe it or not, we spent over a year working on uh, the foundation and the acceptance and doing the stakeholder work around the community. So, actually, the the um, the breakdown of uh, data crunching, as it were, or algorithm, algorithmic processing um, and community validation is uh, very heavily slewed in terms of creating metrics that the community wants, that they understand, that the validation exists for. So we spend a lot of our time looking for consensus um, and understanding, trying to understand what a reasonable process is to apply to a, a given data set. Um, when we're, uh, if, if I was uh, a hypothesis-based scientist, then I would spend a lot more of my time looking at hypotheses and testing them. Whereas actually what we do in Scientometrics is to um, produce numbers and to analyze those numbers, knowing that they're not, um, that it's not telemetry that's built into a process. We can't place uh, sensors into the scientific discovery, the research discovery process. Rather we're measuring, we're observing human processes. And from that perspective, although the methods that we use are close to statistics and math mathematics and so forth, um, actually I, I find it a lot more insightful to approach metrics development from the point of view of someone who has a degree in, um, in social psychology and who is interested in the human phenomena. We have to be very aware that when we produce numbers, we're doing so for a reason. Metrics don't exist as an, an objective entity Rather, they are a view into a particular kind of human activity. And those metrics are uh, developed for a purpose. So uh, when, uh, when, when uh, we try and understand uh, research, we might be able to try to understand how well we're communicating research or how well funding is going, what, uh, what the standing of an international uh, an organization is in terms of its international activity. So, the, the life of a scientometrician is probably not as glamorous as it may as it may first seem on on the level. Um, a lot of the data that we get, because we're not measuring uh, a physical or, or, or a chemical system, a lot of the data that we get is quite messy and it is prone to uh, interpretation and, and human behaviour. So 
for example, in the top right hand corner here, I, I suggested a graph which might be the number of citations per, per decile, perhaps, um, for a set of articles. And typically, what we see is a large number of zeros and large number of very low scoring articles, a moderate range of articles that are getting a reasonable amount of attention. And just to make the things really messy, we have a very small number of articles that get a very large number of attention. I'm going to talk more about these outliers. Um, so when we when we go and sample uh, a series of data that come, comes out of the system, we typically see quite a messy uh, system without, without any obvious straight lines or curves coming out of it. So the first thing we do is to seek to to normalize the that graph by reducing the variability. Typically, as Mike was just talking about, one of the ways we do this is by reducing the data to look at topics or subject areas or institutional data or journal data. So we're, we're trying to reduce the amount of variability in there so that we can start seeing some trends in there. We can start to normalize the data a little bit. And typically, what we get out of there is a, is a fairly messy curve, um, but a curve nevertheless. And that's when it starts getting interesting from a mathematical point of view, because the, our job at this stage, uh, the job of, uh, of research in this field, is very often to take some messy data, to take some curves, and to try and reduce them to lines which we can understand laws or we can apply mathematical um, equations to. So typically, when we see a curve like that, we might apply a log relationship, a logarithmic relationship to it. And this gives us the ability to then um, make comparisons. So for example, we might take a series of data from different disciplines in the same way that Mike has just been doing. We might tidy them up and normalize it. We then might apply logs to it and we'll end up with several different converging lines. And looking at those converging lines gives us an insight into the differences that might be happening, the phenomenon that might be underlying the behavior that we're examining. So one of the things that's really interesting and that, that Mike has really uh, um, uh, written most about is uh, this distribution. Because what happens when we look at this kind of data is very typically we get a linear relationship in the, in the logs. But at the very end, the very upper end of the behavior, we get, um, we get a kick, we get a little hook at the top end there. And they, again, this, this, um, this represents the outliers, and it's a particular area of interest for me. Another way that we might um, reduce the amount of variation is by, um, by sampling over a broader area. And there's, there's a reason why we do that, and there are reasons why we don't do that. So I thought I'd pull out this slide here. So this slide is about a year, a year old, um, and it represents the number of citations per year um, per document in the field of biomaterials. And I extracted this data from uh, the NIH's uh, insights tool. So in this case, what I'm plotting here is 11 different years worth of publishing average citations per year per document over that course of 11 years. So if we look at the, the navy blue line, those are articles that published in 2006. And of course, that means it's got 10 years subsequent citation behavior. And what we see when we look at that field there, so this is all the same field biomaterials, is you see quite a slow rate of progress to two citations per year, typically two years, two full years after publication. But then after that, we see five, six years of fairly static rates of citation for articles that published in 2006. So we're seeing there a, a, an article there, once it's reached maturity, it's being cited quite consistently for the next five or six years before eventually tailing off. Now, if we contrast that with articles being published in 2010, 2011, 2012, these are light blue in the burgundy lines, we're seeing a much faster rate of um, progress in terms of the average citations per document, but then it's peaking really quickly. So in the case of the burgundy line, we're hitting the, uh, the peak rate of citation four years after publishing, and then after that, it's dropping away. So we're seeing very different phenomena here in terms of how this field, um, how this field is being cited over the course of, of um, over the course of an article's lifetime. And in fact, if you compare this field to other fields, so for example, nanotechnology or uh, radiography, perhaps, um, this is a different field. This field is behaving.
behaving quite differently. Normally, we see these lines overlapping each other. We don't see a great deal of variability. And in fact, what this contrasts to is that there was a large investment in the biomaterials field in the, in the sort of the 2010, 2009 period, which has resulted in a structural change in the way that biomaterials is being researched and being reported. And to me, this is really interesting because had we taken a, a, a view that we could sample this data over a three, four, five year period, we probably would have seen the trends. And likewise, had we stripped out the outliers, we also probably would have seen these trends. So sometimes we have to take a view that um, we have to look at the data in a different way to separate out the signals from the noise. And separating out the signals from the noise is one of the key tasks of anyone who's involved in, in creating metrics. It is one of those things that we cannot take a set of data and simply say that one number can possibly um, describe that collection of data. Data, this data, because it's human data, is much more complex than that. So we don't get these nice straight lines coming directly out of it. We have to have an interpreted view. And if we are interpreting, that means that we have to have different filters, different lenses into the underlying data. So for example, if we take a set of data like this, and this might be citations, it might be tweets, it might be Mendeley saves, broadly speaking, it would be similar, whichever one we're choosing, then there are some perils there in, in in, in taking this single number approach to understand it. So for example, if we were to take an arithmetic mean, and I would just add them all up and divide them by the number of articles there for this series, we would end up with a number of 27.4. And um, that's a perfectly good mean. Um, and for normally distributed, symmetrically distributed values like height or IQ, that's a perfectly reasonable thing to do. But in data, which is very highly saloon and has so many, and has these small number of outliers, it's a very, uh, an equal metric to be using to understand. In this case, the number 27.4 is larger than every number in that set except the upper two. If we took the median value, um, in this case, the median value is 0 0.5, so is, uh, is approximating, very close to approximating to zero. In, typically, in altmetric values, we do see a median uh, value of zero. Whereas if we take a geometric mean, then we get a number which gives us an indication of, um, of a value which is somewhere in the middle of that range. So these three different ways, perfectly reasonable ways of understanding different kinds of data can have a very different um, influence on that data. And one of the things that um, can really distort that field is when we do have these outliers, the, the upper, the, the, the article get, that gets a thousand uh, tweets or 10,000 citations can have a, have a massively distorting effect, particularly on the arithmetic mean. So my, my work as a student for Mike is uh, increasingly focusing on the question of what phenomena are underlying the, these trends that are going on. And again, this doesn't really matter whether it's citations, saves, or mentions. Um, there are different ways of understanding these uh, different levels. So for example, um, one of the first cuts that you make, one of the first decisions you might make when you're looking at metrics, particularly altmetrics, is the, the proportion of articles that do get any kind of attention versus don't get any attention. And you've heard um, Mike Seawall's work involves making that decision early on. Kim Holmberg has also published in this space. There are big disciplinary differences between what gets attention and what doesn't get attention. Um, these can vary from about 10% of articles getting some attention in the case of engineering to 40% of articles in the case of psychology known. But my focus is on what's happening at the hook, the upper end here. Um, and that's a particular area of interest for me. So Mike's done a lot of work in terms of understanding the mathematics of this. And, and um, the, the task that I'm setting myself to is trying to understand what that means in terms of a quant, a quant, um, uh, uh, qualifying the, uh, the different kinds of phenomena at the upper, uh, upper level. So if I was going to suggest a hypothesis to you, hypotheses that I might test in terms of these high levels of sharing or saving or citation, I might hypothesize that there are four different phenomena that underlie the very highly cited, very highly saved, very highly shared phenomena. So for example, in the field of genetics, there is a, a method called CRISPR, which is used in gene splicing. It is used um, 
for everyone who does gene splicing, gene genetic engineering these days. Um, so that paper, the CRISPR paper, will get a citation for every uh, every paper that has followed it. And as a consequence, it has many, many tens of thousands of citations. Different fields, by the way, have different uh, views on when you cite that, when you make that kind of canonical citation. So, for example, in the field of chemistry, every single method, every single piece of equipment uh, or, or, or technique used, well, rather, will get a get a citation. So, you do get these outliers that get very highly cited. Um, another reason for um, why you might get a very high altmetric score, for example, is or often amount of citations. Um, would be when you're making a particularly controversial or political point. Now, we do see that in, in uh, altmetric data, of course, but we also see it in, um, in, in citation. Earlier today, I was looking at a paper that reviewed the, um, did a meta-analysis of uh, nutritional advice going back over the last 20 or 30 years, um, and it's making the conclusion that uh, the, the uh, threat to human health, health of the common sugar sucrose was um, perhaps repressed as a consequence of uh, um, uh, editorializing the um, articles. Um, so, you know, it's, it's making a, uh, a suggestion which goes beyond regular science. Another reason why we might see high rates of citation would be an article, a piece of research that changes the shape of, of research. Um, a Kuhnian step, if you like, in, in scientific communication theory, something that advances the cause of the step. And for that reason, an article might get a large number of citations. Another really interesting um, reason would be where someone who is writing within a low citing field um, writes an article that make, creates a, a, a bridge with a very highly citing field. Now, I might throw out. Um, I might hypothesize that you would have a, um, a, a piece of computer science an algorithm that's attempted to understand uh, human space. So published in a theological paper, which is a very low citing article, it might get a large number of citations from, uh, from a computer science article. So what you might have there is different ways. So my work in, in terms of this is to try and understand whether we can identify these phenomena from the, the, the data that is available to us, and as a consequence, um, draw some uh, conclusions or some probabilities to describe why something is being highly cited. So rather than merely say, this is highly cited, try to explore beneath the data to say, what's causing this phenomena? How do we classify it? How do we understand it? We're talking about, here about um, qualitative and quantitative metrics. So most of my work over the last two years has been with dimensions. Um, and that's been largely focused on citation-based metrics. You know, we we have a, a particular desire to see new metrics emerging from the community based on these new numbers that we're finding. But my work has been involved in doing um, metrics that are already well established and well understood by the um, by by the community. Altmetric is much more qualitative, and um, I've had a lot of success and um, heard other people having success using altmetrics to create qualitative narrative stories about what's going on in a particular field. Um, one of the things that I'm going to be talking about later this year is the Zika crisis of two years ago. Um, and in this case, in the, in the case study that I've, I've got here, we look at funding, we look at publishing, we look at policies, we look at altmetrics, we look at social media, we look at Google Trends. And by bringing all those data together, we understand the, uh, the Zika and the, the, the research and funding response to the Zika crisis in a way that you can never understand from pure numbers. You really have to be able to dive into the, into the human stories um, and the human crisis to understand best what's going on there. We can use altmetrics to underpin and understand and explain some of the phenomena that's going on there. Altmetrics in the other world helps us to inform dimensions. Um, the idea of qualitative analysis is supporting my work to understand this high, these are the behavior that drives high levels of citation. And by the same token, work by mathematicians such as Mike Seawall is giving us an opportunity to understand and analyze altmetric data in a way that we really haven't been able to um, do before by using normalization, by using these more advanced mathematical techniques. Digital science um, has a, a particular 
relationship with the metrics community in that what we are not proposing to do is to create black box metrics. Rather, we see ourselves as being partners with the scholarly community who create and use much of this data. So the core focus of Dimensions has been to implement metrics that are very close to the data that already have community acceptance and also to support the development of new metrics amongst the community, in particular when it comes to creating metrics that are bringing together these different kinds of data. So Dimensions has a lot of connections, a lot of edges between grants and articles and patents and clinical case studies, and we're exposing this data in our API and in the UI, and we're hoping to support the community in the development of new metrics. So the final stage of our metrics development process is to implement these metrics. And, and two particular examples, the National Institutes of Health, RCR, and uh, Professor Siegel's MLOP NCS, which we're implementing as our, as our SCR. Um, thank you very much for um, attending our webinar. Um, I'm very happy to hand it back to Stacy for um, any questions. Great, thank you so much, Mike. Uh, so, we have a few questions in already, um, but if you've got more, uh, whether related to Professor Thawal's research on correlations uh, or the work that Mike Taylor has been doing at Digital Science to develop new metrics based in research, uh, we'd love to have them. So, please put them in the questions box that you see here on the GoToWebinar panel on the right. Uh, so, the first question. Um, is actually a really good question. And this is a question that I get a lot, uh, but I kind of wanted to put it to uh, Professor Thelwall because this kind of has to do with um, methodology. So uh, Philip Adams asks if it's possible to use identifiers other than DOIs in order to do this kind of research, uh, whether that there are technical restrictions on ter in terms of what Altmetric collects, uh, which I can answer that, uh, and I probably will in a moment, uh, or if there are decisions that get made about um, why you choose um, DOIs as kind of your way of uh, organizing the work that you do. So um, I will unmute you momentarily. Here we go. There we are. So uh, could you speak to uh, your choice to use DOIs to um, kind of restrict the, the research that you did, Professor Thalwell? Yeah, sure. Thanks, Stacey. And thanks for the question, Philip. So um, DOIs are, are really good for being almost certain that you're analyzing and matching the correct document. So um, we find uh, a, a very small percentage of uh, mistakes in DOIs, less than 0.1%, I think. So it's, a, it's an effective method of deciding whether two mentions of the same document are the same. But it is possible to ignore DOIs and um, match the author, the title, uh, the publishing journal. But if you do that, then the, you have uh, your, the accuracy of the matching automatically is probably going to be somewhere close to 90%, so uh, not 100%. Um, and the reason why is because if it, particularly if it's an article with a short title, then there might be many other articles with the same title or even, or multiple articles, it doesn't have to be many. Um, so a, a short article with a, a common author first name can have multiple occurrences. And also, even if two articles don't have the, exactly the same title and authors, you you still might accidentally match them together if their title and authors are similar, because often articles aren't cited with uh, exactly the correct information. So there are often spelling errors in the title, or the title is shortened, or the author name is is spelt with or without um, uh, accents on the letters of the name. Um, the year is sometimes got wrong. The pages of publication are sometimes wrong. So in practice, when we're matching documents, we have to allow a certain amount of leeway in order to get a, a high proportion of matches. And that allows the possibility of uh, more incorrect matches. So yes, it is possible, but it's, uh, uh, it increases the error rate if you don't use the DOIs. 
Okay. Great, Thanks, thank you. And um, I can speak to how Altmetric organizes our data. I will say that in our database and the data that we make available to researchers, that DOIs have the highest amount of coverage across all of the pieces of research that we track. And they would that would probably be followed, I'd say, by ISBNs, proportionately speaking. So books are going to have a much greater coverage in terms of ISBNs, which we also track, uh, than most other identifiers. I think we're up to something like 10 or 15 different types of identifiers that we track now. Uh, and the same goes for DOIs as they relate to journal articles. So the vast majority of journal articles will have DOIs. Uh, beyond that, archive IDs, I think, is the second most. PubMed IDs, no, PubMed IDs is the second most, uh, followed by archive IDs. So it's about the biggest bang for your buck for most uh, scientometrics researchers. It's how many articles can I find for the reasons uh, that Professor Thalwell pointed out, how many articles can I find that have this particular identifier associated with them? So it's easy to disambiguate. So a uh, full list is of all the various identifiers that Altmetric uses is available online, but DOIs have the highest coverage. So that's often why they're used in scientometric studies. Uh, we have another question. Uh, do the comments and research presented on journal article metrics also apply to individual books? So I will actually open this up uh, to both of you. Mike Taylor, do you maybe want to start us out with your thoughts on the topic? You're still muted. My apologies. There we go. <laughs> go ahead, no, Mike. No, it's OK. It's, uh, it's no problem. Books are a particularly interesting um, area. My, my background was routinely in books. Um, so at the moment, I tend to take a very broad view of uh, the kinds of uh, content that's involved. I haven't done any specific work in, in terms of books, in terms of uh, the, the viral work. Um, I am nevertheless very interested in doing it because it's um, it's up my hypothesis that books fulfill a very different kind of communication um, channel. Um, previously, when I was working with uh, a, a, a research group in the, in the University of Ireland, we were looking at mixed content. So we were looking at both scholarly and um, more social content, and that involved also policy papers and books and, and news. And actually what we were finding there is that they do books and other different kinds of uh, data, do seem to um, fulfill a very different communication criteria. So I think, it, I think it is one of those things that I want to pin down for future work. It isn't at the moment such an easy thing to do because we have um, a very mixed view of, uh, of book content. Um, it is, it's quite an interesting area of, uh, area of uh, work. Um, there are different structures in the way that books are being um, being captured digitally. They are somewhat behind the curve in, um, when we compare them to journals. And I worry a little bit that any work in this field would necessarily be taking a, a very partial view of the phenomenon. Nevertheless, um, from, a, from a position of someone who has a social science uh, degree, I am very curious about um, understanding how books can fit into this. But at the moment, I don't have any particular to report. Yeah, so from uh, from my perspective, uh, Mike Dole here. So from my perspective, um, so, so I uh, I do research books sometimes, uh, usually with Kevin Kusher, who sits a, a meter behind me um, as the lead author. And um, so we find books are really tricky to uh, analyze with citations or Altmetric type data uh, for multiple reasons, really. Firstly, the uh, uh, DOIs, few books have DOIs, and although books have it, ISBNs, they're almost never used in citations. So we have a problem matching the, the citation to the book, which we have to use heuristics for. Uh, and then, secondly, books are often not classified by field. So whereas the, when we analyze journal articles, we usually have a, a field classification. Whereas that's not the case in any books. 
um, because they're less well, well covered, less systematically covered by uh, the traditional citation databases. And the final problem with using citations or altmetrics to evaluate books is that, well, as, as uh, Mike Taylor said earlier, they're, they're an odd kind of object. And, and in particular, you could write a book legitimately for a wide audience, such as a textbook, or you could legitimately write it for a narrow audience, a, a scholarly monograph. So if, you're, if you use one blanket approach for all types of books, for all type of audience, then it doesn't work very well. So I think mm -hmm. books are intrinsically trickier on, on many levels to evaluate than uh, journal articles. I think it's, it is one of those issues that we tend to um, we tend to work on the basis that we know that we're only taking a sample of, uh, of of whatever content it is we're looking at. You know, whatever platform we're talking about, whether it's Dimensions or Scopus or Web of Science, it's always or, or Google Scholar for that matter. It's always going to be a subset of the of the likely literature and, and the the uh, um, effectiveness of our work depends on us understanding um, the, the outer bounds, the, the degree to which we're making an approximation of the real world. And one of the problems with books is that the gap between what is captured as a digital object, um, not as a DOI, but as a, as a digital, as a digital passable object, and the outer boundaries are very large and very diffuse. I mean, as Mike says, you know, we, we are talking about objects which encompass a thesis, which may be read by you know, very, very few people, and which are doing very, very small focused pieces of the work. To major reference works and serials that are attempting to encapsulate the state of art and effectively acting as review. Um, so we're talking about very different kinds of objects. And I think, I think there's some hope that as we go down the, um, the process of making books more digitally findable and referenceable and citable and so forth, the closer we get to being able to measure the approximation between what we know is books and what the outer limits of books are, what the function of books are. But at the moment, we, I don't think we have enough data, we don't really have enough hypotheses to really get a good, um, a good insight into, uh, in, into book performance. Excellent. We have a question for Mike Taylor from Shenmeng Zhu. Uh, can you talk more about the qualitative metrics that you mentioned? For instance, have there been any existing or ongoing efforts or projects or examples of the development of these kinds of qualitative altmetrics? Right. So, um, good. I'm not prepared for this question whatsoever. Um, Mike, perhaps you can pick up, and I'm, I'm going to think through the and part of the question if you've got anything off the top of your head. I mean, certainly um, one of the, um, I know that you've done some work in um, decide, um, and using math, what's the appropriate mathematical uh, approach to understanding whether something's been highly shared or highly saved. So in terms of uh, qualitative metrics, mm, yeah. Um, so I like, um, I don't know if it counts as a qualitative metric, but I like uh, content analysis as a method to investigate uh, the context of citations. So just as a systematic method to get some insights into why a, a, an individual work or a group of uh, articles are cited. I don't, I don't tend to use much qualitative analysis myself, but I enjoy reading it when mm. it's published. Yeah, yeah. I, mean, we, I did some work a few years ago um, with other people looking at, um, particularly with uh, Chao Mei Chen uh, at, uh, at Drexel University. And Chao Mei is looking at uh, the strength of assertion in the content. Now, this doesn't really... Uh, this doesn't feel quite the same as the questions are asking, but nevertheless, um, for me, it was really interesting because Chame is tracking the progress of, um, of statements, facts being reported in scientific literature. So going from um, where people are, 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 are suggesting hypotheses that might be tested at the very broadest end to when people are reporting hard facts, um, you know, perhaps 10 years later in the research. So, he, uh, he uses the uh, example of HIV, so 
the reports that um, you know 10, 20 more years ago, people were suggesting that H H HIV was a potential cause of the uh, AIDS syndrome, whereas now this is reported as being a, a fact, and there are very few people who, who make statements that disagree with the HIV causes AIDS. So from that point of view, it's really interesting to see that sort of change in discourse. Um, and for me, that, 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 that is interesting because it is both a, a quantitative, as you can put numbers to it, but it's also qualitative because it, it gives us an insight into the progress of, um, of, of a field and a fact of a topic. Um, and there's been some work done on uh, sentiment analysis of Twitter as well, which again could be taken as being qualitative. I think, if I remember correctly, the, the majority of tweets are, are simple pointers to research rather than being um, uh, strongly positive or strongly negative um, uh, statements. Um, whereas, you know, when we see uh, uh, um, uh, reviews of, particularly in the in humanities, we tend to see um, more occurrence of uh, negative statements about research because the the question of, of of a review, which by itself invites negative criticism, is is very much the kind of uh, research output that we see in the humanities. We don't really see the same kinds of work in mathematics, for example, or chemistry. If something is not wrong or reproducible, then people tend to ignore it rather than say negative things about it. So I think to understand the role that qualitative um, metrics um, has to play, I think we're going to. I think we're a few years away from seeing um, more robust work being done in this field. What I can say is that where we've done um, this, this this kind of building of case studies, case histories of particular fields um, that I hope we're going to be exploring later on in the year, then we can certainly start seeing how these are working. But it's very much on an individual storytelling narrative creating mode rather than it being a wide scale application. Well, thank you both. We've got just a couple of minutes left, so let's take one more question. Uh, what do you both think about the stability of altmetrics data? This is a question from Aditi, uh, who points out that for a recent article, the article itself got both citations and altmetrics data. And on upon revisiting the article, you were able to see the citations obviously stayed the same. They didn't disappear over time. They just tend to accumulate, whereas the altmetrics data, uh, some of it disappeared, some of the tweets went away, and so on. So uh, how does that factor into how you study uh, what you study? Um, <clears throat> perhaps I can say a little bit about this. So my experience of uh, altmetric data is that uh, it tends to evolve very rapidly when an article is published. And then it seems to stabilize. I haven't noticed tweets disappearing, for example. Um, but my experience is that, uh, in general, there's a rapid increase when an article is published. And there's, uh, if, if you monitor the altmetric scores for an article, there appears to be a, a huge amount of uh, attention as soon as the article is published. Um, but it's hard to know if some of this attention didn't slowly accumulate when the article was previously shared by the author, and then it suddenly gets registered when uh, the article is formally published. But uh, there's certainly big increases when uh, at publication date, around publication date, and then slower increases after that, on average. Okay, thank you so much, Mike. Um, we are now at time. So we will end the webinar there. Thank you so much to our presenters today. It's been fantastic to have you on, to hear about the state-of-the-art research that's happening. And thank you so much to our attendees, especially those who asked really thought-provoking questions. We hope to all see you online again soon. Take care. Thanks, Casey. Thank you.